right, should we go ahead and get started? Excellent. Thank you so much. So um, my name is Wendy Perlman. I'm the Interim Director of the Middle East and North Africa Studies Program. So on behalf of MENA Studies and the Medill School of Journalism, we are delighted to welcome you all to this collaborative event. One month ago today, the Palestinian Hamas movement broke Israeli controls on the Gaza Strip to launch murderous attacks on Israeli civilians and soldiers. Vowing to destroy Hamas, Israel bombarded, has bombarded Gaza with a tonnage exceeding that dropped on Hiroshima and cut off fuel, electricity, water, medicine, and food to the civilian population. We express our deepest sympathies to all who grieve this ongoing tragedy, including the many in our community watching with horror and with anguish. To date, more than 1,400 people have been killed in Israel and 3,300 people injured, while 242 people remain held hostage. At least 10,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza, 25,000 injured, and 1.5 million forcibly displaced, while 2,300 people remain missing or buried under the rubble. Today we gather with heavy hearts, but I hope with open minds, coming together to listen, to learn, to begin a necessary conversation that will continue for many months to come on our campus. I see this event today as having at least two objectives. First, to remember behind each of these numbers, those numbers I just read out, as well as the family and friends left behind, there is a human story. And second, to remember that beyond the unspeakable suffering of the past month is a larger historical and political story, and that we cannot understand current events if we don't attend to that context. How do we tell these stories, both of individual lives upended by violence and of the larger structures of power that produce violence in myriad forms? How do we tell these stories? What can we learn from them? What can telling stories achieve? To help us explore these questions together, we are fortunate to have a special guest. Nathan Thrall is an author and essayist who lives in Jerusalem. He spent a decade at the International Crisis Group, where he directed the Arab-Israeli Project. His essays, reviews, and features have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, London Review of Books, and the New York Review of Books. He has written two books, The Only Language They Understand, Forcing Compromise in Israel and Palestine, published in 2017, and A Day in the Life of Abed Salama, Anatomy of a Jerusalem Tragedy, which was published just last month. The latter book was named one of New Yorker's best books of 2023 and a top nonfiction book to read this fall by the New York Times. Among the many glorious reviews that this book has received are these words from The Observer. I quote, a day in the life of Abed Salama brims over with just the sort of compassion and understanding that is needed at a time like this. Thrall looks at the Israeli-Palestine conflict with unflinching clarity and above all, with nuance. This is a book that speaks with deep and authentic truth of ordinary lives trapped in the jaws of history. Today, Nathan will be in conversation with Medill Professor Peter Slevin. Professor Slevin has a long career in journalism and writing, having worked for the Miami Herald, Washington Post, and The New Yorker, in addition to authoring an ambitious and successful biography of Michelle Obama. We aim tonight for about 45 minutes of conversation, followed by Q&A, and after which Nathan will sign the books for sale outside. Thank you all for being here, and the floor is yours, Nathan and Peter. Thank you. 
Oh, there he is. With Heidi. This is much better. Let's try that. How about that? Hooray. Got it. <laughs> um, we gather on the uh, start of the second month of this brutal battle in Gaza, and though even less noticed, uh, increasingly tense conflict in the West Bank with a significant risk that the violence and even the combat could spread. As everyone knows, the uh, dangerous latest phase of the Israel-Palestinian Israel conflict started on October 7th, and we're now at a point where the, the phrase coming from Gaza is, there is no safe place in Gaza. And yet, as Nathan's book shows us, the roots of the conflict run deep, and he set out to tell his readers about it. I thought it could be helpful, since not everyone will have read the book, um, just to say briefly what it is about. Um, Nathan, an American living in Jerusalem, heard about a bus crash in February 2012 um, that cost the lives of a teacher and six kindergartners, Palestinians. In that crash, he saw a chance to write um, about what seemed very wrong to him, what he had been watching for years while working for the International Crisis Group. Um, the result is riveting, it's illuminating, as Wendy said. Um, it's an account of about that bus, why it was on a particular road on that particular rainy day, why those Palestinian children were on that bus, and what happened next when the bus caught fire. Uh, through the characters in this book, especially Abed Salama, Nathan also offers a revealing window into the last 75 years of history. And somehow he does it in 217 pages, a lesson to us all. And this is what gifted writers do. This is, they start with questions, not answers. They start, uh, they dig deeply, they consider all angles, they find characters, they, they identify small scenes that illustrate something larger. And as they ask questions and put fingers to keyboard, they also assess their own biases, their own preconceptions. And Lord knows we all have them. Um, and then they spin a little bit of magic, which is what Nathan has done. And it's hard. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit with Nathan about how it was that you settled on this topic and how you went about it, because it's clear that it, there were some very grueling aspects, too. Um, so let's just start at the beginning. How did you decide to do this book? Um, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Wendy. Thank you for moderating, Peter. Um, you know, I, I uh, live in Jerusalem, and my work took me into the West Bank um, um, nearly every day. And um, Jerusalem is a landscape of uh, walls and uh, segregation that one becomes uh, accustomed to um, uh, when you live there. And one particular area of the city um, is a walled enclave. It's surrounded on walls uh, on all sides. It has um, the 26 foot tall separation barrier on uh, three sides. And on the fourth side is another kind of wall that runs through a uh, segregated road, Route 4370, which is famously known as the Apartheid Road. Israeli traffic on one side, Palestinian on the other, and a giant wall running through it. And I would you know, pass by this uh, community, this walled enclave, um, every day, and I wouldn't pay it any mind. And when this crash occurred, um, I couldn't stop thinking about the parents and children uh, and teachers who were involved in this uh, accident. And um, I decided that I would write uh, a book about the accident and about all the different lives, both Jewish and Palestinian, that intersected uh, on that day. And I, I saw very early on in my conversations with different people involved in, in the accident that I could really tell the story of Israel-Palestine uh, in microcosm. 
which wasn't couldn't have been completely obvious from the first moment. So what was it? What was that moment, that time when you said, "Right, this one crash, which wouldn't have passed unnoticed, but of course had faded several years later when you were focusing on it, could be the thing." Um, the truth is that I had long thought that something like this could be um, a book that would tell the story of Israel-Palestine. And in fact, I believe that virtually any place, I mean, you could throw a pin at any place on that map and wind up, if you dig mm. deeply, uh, tell the whole story of Israel-Palestine. It's impossible not to. Um, and this this one moved me, but there would be there were many other um, events that I could have chosen, um, and yeah, I mean certain certain things particularly resonated when I interviewed people. My instinct, you said that the you know book is is short, you know my instinct as a writer, or my flaw as a writer is I want to stuff everything I, po I possibly can in any given piece of writing, and so this was also. Um, it took a great deal of restraint to try and keep as tightly focused on the crash as I could and to limit myself in telling the history that it would only do so through the eyes and family histories of the characters, that there would be no omniscient narrator who comes in and says, in 1967, Israel, blah, blah, blah. That's what makes it so intriguing that you found Abed himself, and I'd love to get to that in a minute. But first, to... Um, but for, and we'll, get, we'll talk about Abed in, in a minute and how you came to choose him and what you're able to say through him. Um, but what, tell us what, what it was about the nature of the crash, where the bus was, where the students were going, that illustrated for you the, the occupation and, and what Palestinians were enduring. Um, so th this uh, walled enclave, uh, the town is called Anatta. Uh, the other part of the enclave is uh, Shuafat camp. And inside this walled enclave, it's, it's um, half annexed by Israel and half unannexed. So um, half of it is officially within the municipality of Jerusalem, half of it is not. If you enter this area, you couldn't tell the difference between the annexed and the unannexed parts. Um, and uh, this area sits, you know, just underneath the um, grounds of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. From the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, you can look down and see this enclave to see this, the checkpoint that people are waiting in to take their kids to school or to go to their jobs. And you can see that it is uh, dilapidated, that the roads have no lanes, that they're barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another, the main thoroughfare for 130,000 people, a, a bus and my car cannot uh, safely make it around one another without inching by one another and my pulling in my side mirror uh, to get around the bus on the main thoroughfare for this 130,000 people. So it's, you know, that's how these people are living day in and day out. There's not a single ATM. There's, there are no playgrounds, there are no sidewalks. And, um, and so the, the segregation is so vivid there. Um, when you're inside of it, you look you, you know, in the cracks between the buildings and you see playgrounds of the Jewish settlement of Pisgat Ze'ev. You see red-roofed villas and um, uh, very nice homes and they're right there staring at one another. Um, so that was one aspect of it that drew me in. Um, but another was, was just, um, was Abed himself and um, how much he uh, opened up to me. What I found with many of the people in this book is that they were, um, it's not entirely about grieving parents, but there are a number of grieving parents in the book and um, in, an, in most cases, these parents were yearning to talk about this event, and uh, no one around them talked about it. There was a cloud of silence. Everyone was afraid to upset uh, the bereaved. And, um, and so when I came to them, you know, seven, eight years later, 
and asked them about the accident, it, everything came pouring out. And it wasn't just the day of the accident, it was their whole life story. Um, and that was also a moment where I realized, you know, this is, this is the whole story of Israel-Palestine. It's not just this accident. When you went into those conversations, and I think anyone who's been a reporter deals with this, you have to wonder whether people are going to be comfortable talking, whether you're the right person to be asking the questions, whether you have a right to ask the questions. How did you get to the point where you said, well, I'm going to go for it? Um, you would have been an outsider to this community, mostly. Yes. Um, Many of these families had had reporters come to them in the days after the accident, and I was coming to them years later. Um, and I wasn't really afraid of approaching them as an outsider. I'm used to being an outsider. Um, I'm really an outsider to both societies. Um, I feel connected to both societies, but also I feel like an outsider. Tell us, tell us about that. Both of those things, connected and an outsider to both societies. Well, I mean, I, I have you know deep deep friendships uh, on in in both communities, and um, I, I love many Israelis and I love many Palestinians. And um, there are you know Israelis and Palestinians who are you know part of my extended family who are dear to my children, and I, I, um, I feel deeply connected in that way. Um, but I also, I'm, I'm not of either society, and, uh, and that's apparent. And, uh, and, and, and I think that in this case, with the, the Palestinian characters, being an outsider was an advantage, um, because Palestinian, society is very tightly knit. And if a Palestinian journalist were to come and start asking the same questions I was asking, I would think that a, you know most Palestinians would immediately calculate how many degrees removed am I from this person? Which relative are they connected to? How is what I'm going to say gonna come back to person X or Y? I think there would be more caution. Whereas with me, Perhaps wrongly, they they felt uh, comfortable to to um, let it all uh, come out. <clears throat> so I couldn't help but uh, uh, enjoy a piece that um, Leila Fadel at NPR did with you that ran the other day. And uh, if you haven't listened to it, it's worth it's worth seven minutes of your time um, because sh she speaks not only with Nathan but with with Abel himself, with Abed himself, um, and she says, "Now, Abed, what made you decide to spend time and talk to Nathan, tell your story, and be part of this book?" And he said, "Abed says so." When he told me, "Maybe your story will make a difference about our Palestinian issue," so because of that, I decided to share him everything. He saw a purpose in it, and then uh, she asked, "What was it like to read the book?" And he's, he responded, I like it because he writes from the bottom of his heart. And when I read the article, I read it in English. I'm not strong in English, but I understand every word because he's telling the truth. That is no small bit of praise for someone you worked with. And yet, you had to piece all of this together from so many different threads. How did you decide on Abed as your main character? Um, well, I should say that there were people who um, didn't. Uh, speak to me, mm. and um, you know there, there's a, um, a story from the um, from the uh, recent months with with Abed is, is you know I did not share the book with him until there was a hardcover to give him, mm. and you know a journalist almost never will share a manuscript with the subject of that journalism, but in this case I really debated it, and I was. Um, very worried about how he would react to the book. <clears throat> and in the end, I decided that I just didn't want to litigate, you know, the, the content of the book, so I didn't share it with him until um, the end. And after he finished reading it, he said to me, there's another character in the book, a mother named Nancy, and he said to me, um, her tragedy is much 
uh, greater than mine. Mm. Um, why did you choose me? And um, the, you know, there were a couple of different answers. One of them was that I just bonded with Abed. I spent so much time with him. I met him first. I, I had spent a lot of time with him before I interviewed Nancy. Um, but the other answer was this kind of a structural one, which was that I had these two parallel timelines and ambitions for the book. There was the narrative of the crash and its aftermath, but there was also the deep history that I wanted to convey. And balancing those two things structurally was an enormous challenge because a given character may appear in the chronology of the crash at a certain time, but in fact, their deep history, their family history, you would rather present at a different time. So um, the, the focus on Abed was in great part because of his life story and because uh, also his uh, journey to find his son took a very long time. It took 36 hours for him to find the fate of his son and through his life story, I could tell the story of the first intifada which, in which he was active. I could tell the story of his torture and imprisonment. I could tell the story of his early loves and marriages and uh, describe kind of the depth of the, um, the depth to which the system that he lives in reaches into intimate details of his life so that at one point he even chooses a marriage partner in the hope of getting a certain color ID that would allow him to retain his higher paying job in Jerusalem and provide for his family. Um, and so it, it, it was uh, details like that that I felt um, made Abed um, the, the right person to be at the center of this book. And as I remember, you, were, you also were able to talk about the land that his family had once owned that was now occupied by, by others. And then this, and then his grief, which is no small thing. Did you become close to your characters, some of them? And what was that like? Yeah, I mean, to Abed in particular, I became quite close. I spent a lot of the last few years of my life with him. He was on book tour with me initially. He had to go home uh, early because the entire situation in the West Bank right now is reminiscent of the Second Intifada. The, his town and others are closed and all the work uh, has dried up. Um, there's a surge in settler violence. His son is told not to go to work because the roads are unsafe. Um, you know, it, it was, um, for me, I, 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 I've just felt an enormous responsibility because of the degree to which he trusted me. And although he was very complimentary on with the microphone on and NPR, uh, there was a more complicated response to the book, which is that he had read only the first part initially. Mm -hmm. And he called me two, out, two days after I got the hardcover and he said, you know, I've finished the first part, which is entirely about his love lives. And, uh, and he said, you know, um, I, I didn't know you were going to include this many details. And, uh, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble in Anatta, in my town. Like, everyone's going to come after me. I'm exposing, you know, family secrets, how my sister-in-law, whom I've never confronted, uh, betrayed me and changed my entire life with this betrayal. Um, you know, I'm I'm speaking rather unfavorably about the main political party in the town. That betrayal, by the way, is very juicy. <laughs> it's very diabolical. Um, <laughs> so so every he said everyone's going to come after me, and I said, you know, please just read to the end and let's talk after that. And believe it or not. Other people told me worse things. <laughs> uh, and, and so he finished the book and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to, to face the consequences. I understand what, what you're doing and why all of these details are there. Wow. Um, and so I mean, yeah, it's to his great credit that he um, has remained my friend. <laughs> and, yeah. Were there times when you wondered whether you were the one to tell this story or that 
you could really get your arms around it? Do you have, did you have doubts along the way? I mean, maybe I should have, but I didn't, no. Very cool, if you didn't. Yeah, I mean, it, because it, it felt like a story that nobody else was going to tell. And so I just didn't, I didn't have those, those qualms because I felt that if I didn't do it, no one else was going to. Were there um, times when you had to step back from these interviews? I've read that you cried with Abed. You would tell your wife these stories and that it sounded pretty grueling. Yeah, I mean, I think not half as grueling as it was for the people who were talking to me. Um, but yeah, I w that was the process. Is I would interview people, sometimes I would grieving with them in the middle of our discussions. And then I'd come back and I'd tell my wife, I'd relay what I had heard and uh, she would be weeping. Yeah, it was, it was like that for a couple years. You say it so casually, <laughs> it's very impressive. Um, that is one of those things that journalists and writers do confront, especially if, if you're from the, the West where you're covering refugees or a climate catastrophe or a war, and that the, the fact, I was gonna say the sense, but the fact, you can just get on a plane. You're gonna go to Paris for the weekend. You're, gonna, you're going to escape, you're gonna go home to your nice place. And it's something journalists here are dealing with trauma or crime scenes or neighborhoods um, where people have less privilege have to deal with. Um, did you feel that sense of um, distance at times from your subjects? And how did you deal with that? Uh, yes, I did. Um, you know, my life and the life of anybody in my position is one of just the, the starkest contrasts. I mean, <clears throat> I know, you know, um, Israel Prize winning um, professors at the Hebrew University who spend their weekends um, accompanying shepherds in the West Bank and protecting them from settler attacks. And some of these, you know, very renowned scholars, one of them was shot in the stomach by settlers. I mean, um, that's their weekend. And then they come home and they go to a nice, you know, dinner in a fancy restaurant and Tel Aviv and everybody's oblivious to what's happening a couple miles away and um, and you know is tired of hearing about this professor's you know activity in the you know with the shepherds in the West Bank um, and and for me as well you know when one of the the most intense interviews that I've had uh, with Nancy you know that evening I was going to a wedding. Um, of you know Israeli Jews in the in the center of, of Israel, and you know these people are are living so close to one another and are totally oblivious to what's happening in their name with their tax dollars by their children uh, who are serving in the army, um, and the whole system is built to allow them to be oblivious. That's the success, how, is, how has this thing lasted as long as it has? Well, one of the main reasons is that you could live for decades without really thinking about it. Hearing you say that, I'm struck by um, the voice you chose in the course of the book, which, in which you didn't say those things. You do at the end, in the last few paragraphs, um, you say, here's, what's going on, here's why you need to know about it. And I'm interested in that in both ways. One is you decided to keep a more neutral voice throughout, kind of a reporter's voice throughout, but at the end you wanted to, was it that you wanted to make extra sure nobody missed the point or, or what? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I fully thought about that, that, that I had made that shift in those final paragraphs. To me, it was obviously a book needs a conclusion and uh, somehow it just felt right. 
uh, to do it there. But you're right. You know, I, I refrain from having any kind of, you know, omniscient narrator voice and weighing in with my own views and are summarizing things in a analytical or polemical way. Um, I think by that point I felt, um, you know, I'd earned it, that the, the, uh, the reader has reached these conclusions and just wants it kind of spelled out in a couple paragraphs, but uh, maybe, maybe I could have done without it. I sort of imagine it felt really satisfying. <laughs> like, okay, now here's what you need to know. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, some of your other characters. We talk about Abed, but the book is peopled with um, characters who are Jewish, who are Israeli, who are Palestinian, who occupy various points on the ge you know, sort of the, the political and geographical spectrum. Um, one of those is Huda Mahmoud. Can you tell us about her and maybe a little bit about what she experienced that day that you then wrote about? Um, so, Huda meant that more. Sorry, that's okay. Um, so Huda is a um, a Palestinian doctor uh, and mother who um, her deep history is um, that her family came from Haifa and they were forced to flee in 1948, and she was born in refugee camp in Syria and had really no hope of ever coming to the West Bank or Gaza or Haifa. Um, but she married a um, PLO diplomat who was the um, ambassador to uh, Romania at one point. And after the Oslo Accords in 1993, there was a short window in which many PLO officials were allowed to return and so she was one of a very few number of Palestinian refugees who did come to the West Bank uh, or Gaza uh, in the mid-1990s. And that was her great ambition in her life was to come back uh, to Palestine. And she raises her children there and she's experiences great disappointment, actually, at, first of all, her inability to go to Haifa. Secondly, when she does go and visit shortly Haifa, how different it is from the stories that she had been told, how it had been transformed. Um, and it's also uh, a story of um, motherhood and of having a boy raised in uh, this condition of occupation, of being harassed by soldiers outside his school on a weekly basis, and eventually watching him join these other kids and throwing stones at the soldiers, and her torment over um, her knowledge of what that's going to lead to. And she would watch from a distance, and she'd recognize him from his clothes. He would be wearing a, you know, a, a mask so he couldn't be identified. And she had to stop herself from going to talk to him or to help the soldiers identify who he was by seeing her talk to him. And one night, as she's sure is going to happen at 1.30 in the morning, the jeeps show up and uh, rap at the door and she opens it and they say, we're coming for Hadi, your, your, her son. And uh, she's totally powerless to do anything to protect her boy. She's afraid even to reach out and hug him before he goes out off to jail because she's imagining how if any sudden motion would look like uh, threatening and they could be shot. And, uh, and she spends you know 10 days just trying to find what detention facility he's in. Um, and, and so, um, who does stories, both the story of refugees, it's also the story of parents who are powerless to protect their children. Um, and um, she came upon the accident. Um, she was working for the UN refugee agency, UNRWA, and they were on their way to a small uh, Bedouin community called Khan al-Ahmar, which is in the news all the time because it's 
at uh, risk of being demolished by Israel. Um, it's uh, right next to a settlement in which another character in this book lives. And, um, and on her way there, she sees this burning bus. She and her team, her me small medical team, get out and try and help and pull kids off of this bus. And all Huda can think about when she's looking at this carnage is what she describes as the worst day of her life, which was 1985. She was working for the Palestine Red Crescent in Tunis. And at that time, the PLO headquarters were there. And the, uh, Israel bombed the PLO headquarters. Dozens of Palestinians and Tunisians died. And she was asked to pull uh, bodies and body parts out of the rubble. Um, and that's kind of another theme of the book is how all of these different characters see this bus and they have different images uh, and memories that are conjured for them um, and how they're living with the scars of uh, violence and dehumanization. It's extraordinarily powerful the way you're linking their histories with that moment with the bus. And you write about what happened to what she was thinking and what she did that day, that afternoon, and what she was told when she was trying to solve a <coughs> riddle in her mind, which is why everything was so quiet. Yeah. Can you tell us about what she was experiencing or read a little bit of it? With pleasure, thanks. So the portion I'm going to read now is um, uh, near the end of the rescue. Uh, and um, there are two other uh, characters who are mentioned. <clears throat> uh, one is named Salem, who was a, a bystander who went inside the burning bus and carried uh, dozens of children out or pushed dozens of children out through the windows of, of the bus. Um, and another, uh, the only other person who went in with him uh, was a teacher named Ula. And I'm going to um, mention them uh, briefly. Nearly 20 minutes had passed since Huda and her staff had come upon the burning bus. Flames and smoke were still pouring from the smashed windows. Huda's driver, Abu Faraj, was directing traffic, keeping an open path for the evacuees and telling drivers of oncoming cars to turn back. The crowd had grown so large that Huda could no longer see the driver and the teacher she and Salem had pulled from the front of the bus. She was focused on the children, gently carrying them with one of the UN nurses to the cars that had stopped at the accident site. Many of the drivers had volunteered to transport the burn victims and stood ready to race to the nearest accessible hospital, which, for most of them, was in Ramallah. The hospitals in Jerusalem were far better, but only those with blue IDs could reach them. A few of the drivers did have blue IDs, and some took off in the direction of Hadassah Hospital at Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. The majority, those with green IDs, went in the opposite direction, along the flooded road to Ramallah. Nearly all the children had been brought off the bus when Salem, who had by now gone in and out of the flames several times, saw that Ula, the teacher and his partner in the rescue, was trapped beneath a front seat and her leg was burning. But by the time he got to her, it was too late. She was gone. He carried Ula from the bus and placed her on the ground. Her nephew, Sadi, watched in the rain while a man covered her with his coat. In all of this, Salem had felt nothing, not even as someone in the crowd grabbed at his arm and pinched him. One of Huda's nurses yelled to him that his jacket was on fire. He shouted back that it was not. The nurse put it out as he went to climb back into the bus. The few children still inside were no longer alive. The last boy Salem pulled out was facing down, crouched behind the frame of a seat. He was still wearing a backpack, which Salem held to pick the boy up. Stepping out of the bus for the final time, Salem broke out weeping shouting that he should have saved more. Somehow, not a hair on his head was burned. 
Abu Faraj stood unmoving, in shock, as if mesmerized by the flames. Huda turned to the nurse beside her and saw that her face was black and streaked by rain. She realized she must look the same. They were soaked and bone weary, and there was nothing more for them to do. When a Palestinian ambulance finally arrived, most of the injured children had already been evacuated. Huda didn't even notice it. The bus was still crackling with flames and there was much shouting and commotion. Not a single firefighter, police officer, or soldier had come. Huda wanted to follow the children. She found her team and they returned to the UNRWA van. Nida, the pregnant pharmacist, was still inside, inconsolable. Abu Faraj started dropping off everyone at home as Huda called around and confirmed that most of the children were in Ramallah. Then she phoned her UNRWA supervisor. He didn't understand the magnitude of the accident and demanded that the team turn around and go to Khan al Ahmar or he would cut their pay. Huda refused and said he should cut just her salary, no one else's. After stopping for a quick shower, Huda set off for the hospital, taking the clinic's social worker with her. When they got there, word spread that Huda had been at the crash. A great many parents and other relatives sought her out, asking whether she had seen a boy with a Spider-Man backpack, a girl with her hair and yellow ribbons. Huda told them all the same thing. The children had been covered in soot, and she couldn't tell what they were wearing. Going from room to room, Huda checked on the injured children, soothing them. Since leaving the bus, she had felt something nagging at her. She was sure the kindergartners had been silent, at least early in their ordeal. Now, at the bed of one girl, Huda asked her why that was, why she had heard no sound. We were so scared, the girl said. When we saw the flames, we thought we had died. We thought we were in hell. And there you have it, the scene and the voices and um, the impact on every single one of the people who were involved. Um, and what Nathan writes is the accident crushed every family each in its own way. And it's interesting to think of it as an accident because in many ways you don't feel it was. I mean, it is a truck crashes into a bus, but there's more to it, yeah? That's right. The um, you know the deep subject of the book is really the system in which all of these people live and how the policies that were put in place led to the uh, particular sequence of events on that day and how they were entirely predictable and other incidents like this have occurred on the other side of the wall with equally predictable results. <clears throat> and so, yes, the, um, the word accident is used, but the um, response was um, entirely foreseeable. I'd love to get to the, to the present day and also to what you've experienced on this book tour with ads being pulled from, the, from NPR and from the BBC and events being canceled. But I wanted to ask about one more character. Um, there are many more characters, um, and it's not all completely grim. There's, uh, for example, um, an Israeli army colonel who befriends Abed, is, has befriended actually Abed's cousin who works for the Palestinian Authority, and they work together in a, in a compelling way. But what I found one of the most intriguing and mystifying characters to be Danny, the designer, the architect of the wall that is this thing that you, that symbolizes everything that you're writing about and has these practical effects that are kind of everything you abhor. Tell us a little bit about how you got to him and how you dealt with him in telling his story. Um, you know, uh, Danny is um, a colonel in the IDF. <clears throat> He's a settler. He um, is a prominent uh, public speaker um, 
He leads many tours for evangelical groups and others, uh, congressional groups that come. He's a real expert on the uh, territorial dimensions of the, uh, of, of the West Bank. He himself um, was the um, creator not just of the wall and the route of the wall, but prior to that in the Oslo Accords, he's the one who s created the map of the West Bank as we know it today with 165 little islands of limited Palestinian autonomy surrounded by a sea of Israeli full control and administration. Um, all of that was his doing, and he was there in every negotiation, every t territorial negotiation with the Palestinians, and he conceives of himself as somebody who is pursuing peace. And, um, and you know, that's, that's not an uncommon uh, thing to find. And, um, you know, as my Goal. I was really grateful that Danny didn't look me up before I met him because he may have refused uh, <laughs> if he had read some of my other writing. Um, but um, he was very open and I was um, quite interested in not just in his you know, immediate history and his participation in the negotiations and the choices that he made. You know, he designed the wall around Anatta and Shuafat camp and he could have routed the wall on the municipal line, but instead he routed it so that it would push as many Palestinians as he could without giving up too much land outside the center of the city, and was very explicit about that. Um, and I also found quite uh, uh, important, you know, his, uh, his own backstory and his family history, his his par his grandparents were, you know, early Zionists who themselves were rebels against their own religious uh, family uh, in Eastern Europe, and like many early Zionists, you know, they were total outliers. Their their family were uh, Orthodox and. Most Orthodox opposed Zionism. Uh, most American Jews opposed Zionism until uh, you know the 1940s, and um, and and he you know was actually speaking quite openly about how he felt. Um, a lot of this, I again, this is where I had to stick to the tight narrative of the book. But um, there's a lot about early Zionism that I wanted to explore through his family, and, and one, one aspect of it was that Danny feels that the early Zionists, like his grandparents, were anti-Semitic. He feels that they were so virulent in their hatred of the diaspora Jew, mm -hmm. the ones who refused to come with them and immigrate to Palestine, that they were promoting the idea of the new Jew. Uh, who was strong and a pioneer and the opposite of everything that they perceived the diaspora due to be. And so they would um, denounce in anti-Semitic terms the diaspora Jew as, you know, weak and, m you know, money lenders and parasitic on the society and all of these uh, terms. I mean, the, half the streets in Tel Aviv are named after people with horrible anti-Semitic mm -hmm. quotes about the diaspora. And um, anyway, Danny was a, was a very um, interesting person to talk to, and uh, to me an exemplar of how you can, in your personal life, be an obstacle to any kind of um, resolution of, of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue, and yet perceive yourself to be at the forefront of, of pursuing peace. <clears throat> this is completely fascinating, um, as you all can see. Um, I want to open it to questions in just a minute. Um, I'm kind of guessing there might be some questions about what's going on now, so maybe I won't go deeply into that. But um, October 7th, where were you? What did you think? And then how did that make you think about your book? Um, I was in New York. My book was published October 3rd. <clears throat> I had just done a couple of events uh, in New York. It was, um, I had just come back with Abed from 
an event in New Jersey uh, at the Palestinian American Community Center in Clifton, New Jersey. And we, um, he was staying in uh, one apartment a couple blocks away from me in, in Brooklyn. And uh, my wife sent me a voice note on WhatsApp um, with, uh, with sirens and said something's going on. And I looked online and there wasn't a single article, even on Twitter, none of the videos had appeared yet. And so I kept <clears throat> searching and then I saw that first video of a truck of um, you know, members of Hamas's military wing in the back of a truck in the middle of Sterot. Um, and that image, I just could not believe my eyes. It was a shocking image. It was something nobody expected to see. Um, and um, I immediately knew that something very big was happening. This is before the extent of the atrocities was known. Just the very fact of this uh, truck in Sterot, I knew that something huge was going to happen. And, um, and you know, it, it, there was no doubt in my mind that there was going to be a giant war in Gaza. Um, right away. Right away you felt that? Yes. Yes. And... Uh, and in fact, I, I was interviewed by somebody hours after this had all happened as it was unfolding. I probably would say a few things differently now, but that part was clear. Um, <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I also knew that this was going to be a disaster for my book um, because, um, you know, the whole purpose of this book was to reach people and to have them sympathize with the lives of ordinary uh, Palestinians and also uh, Jews living in, in this system. And you know, part of the driving force of the book was actually frustration with <clears throat> constantly looking only at Israel-Palestine when there's a war in Gaza, when there's an invasion in Janine, when there's some dramatic incident. I wanted you know, when that happens, everyone calls for calm. I wanted to show what does that calm look like? What is that calm? It's actually not so calm. And uh, it is, uh, you know, there's a great deal of violence to uphold that system. That system produces violence in turn. And I wanted our attention to be focused on that and not, uh, you know, just Gaza when there's a war in Gaza. But of course, when there is a war in Gaza, it, one must pay attention to it. And so that has, has made it um, quite complicated. One thing about writing such a fine book is that the book will endure and the lessons in it. Thank you. Let I me open so. up to questions. Um, who has, a, who has a, a question for Nathan? I think Jack does, and there appears to be a microphone headed your way. Except it passed him, but that's okay. Well, I, I was just moving it one place. Oh, oh. I can, I'll take it. That's the other thing. <laughs> oh, I just didn't think to. I didn't know. Anyhow. Uh, thank you very much for that. I haven't read the book yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I want to ask a question about the writing process, and I really don't know anything about writing. But when you start a book like this, I envision that you have to have sort of an audience in your mind. And how does that influence how you put together a book like this? Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's something I've heard a lot of writers talk about, that they have an audience in mind. Um, for me, it, it's much, it was much more general than that. I, I really didn't have a particular kind of reader in mind. I was really trying. It was obvious to me that I was writing for a non-expert reader. And I wanted this to be something that could be absorbed by someone who couldn't point to Israel-Palestine on a map and didn't care about Israel-Palestine. That was clear, that was, but beyond that, there was no real, you know, that was really the guiding principle and that drove a lot of other choices like the fact that all of the history that's conveyed, it's only through the 
perspective of the characters, only through the life histories or family histories of the characters. Um, so the main constraint was just, you know, the idea that I was writing this for um, somebody who um, didn't know anything about Israel-Palestine, while also, of course, not being painful to read for somebody who does know. Thanks. Thank you, both of you. If you were to opt into a discussion among people now, among the countless numbers of people who are having discussions or not knowing if they should have discussion, and it's fraught, and it's angry, and it's accusatory, et cetera, what cautions or what observations or what correctives would you want to bring into that discussion based on the work you've done, based on the book? Think about this. What would you say? What would you be saying? I mean, uh, one thing that is a kind of recurrent theme, I think, in terms of the gap in uh, perceptions that has real consequences for the failure of all of these negotiations and <clears throat> in, in many, many senses, it is um, that many in the US and certainly in US officialdom and many on the Israeli center left, this is not so true of the Israeli right, um, believe that the conflict is primarily about the 1967 occupation, the occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And if you believe that that's what the conflict is primarily about, then you think that, um, you know, having Palestinians get 22% of historic Palestine is a very generous offer, and of course that's a maximalist position, and so it's reasonable that in any negotiation, particularly in a negotiation where one party is much stronger than the other, that the weaker party is not gonna come anywhere near their maximalist position, and therefore any Palestinian uh, rejection of anything approaching, you know, okay, you didn't get, you got 5% less than the 22%. You know, I mean, it's clearly not really about that. Uh, it's about your hatred of Jews, your, your inability to countenance the idea of there being a state of Israel, et cetera. And, um, and so, you know, most Palestinians would never say that the conflict is primarily about the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. They, they would say that the most egregious abuses all, uh, occur within the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, but the conflict is about, well, it started with Zionism and the first Zionist settlers coming in 1882 at a time when the Jewish population in Palestine was less than 5%, and they came with an ambition not to you know, live in equality and have a refuge and a, you know, state with the Palestinian majority, but um, to create their own state, a, a Jewish state, or a Jewish homeland was the term initially. And, um, and they reject the notion that Jews had a right when they're 5% to create a state in Palestine against the will of the native majority, and that of course, culminates in the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 and the expulsion of 750,000 uh, Palestinians. And, uh, uh, you know, within the State of Israel, which took up 78% of historic Palestine, 80% um, of the Palestinian population in that territory uh, was uh, forced to flee, was displaced. and a majority was turned into a minority overnight, and they weren't allowed to come back. And that's, you know, what the conflict is about. And uh, over many years of arm twisting and defeat and confrontation with realism and where the international community is and all the rest, the Palestinian national movement said, we will accept a state in the West Bank and Gaza on 22% of the land, and this is an enormous historic concession 
we're half the people, if, even if you exclude the refugees, we're half the people living under Israeli control. There are seven million Jews, seven million Palestinians living under Israeli control. Mass, vast majority of the Palestinians don't have basic civil rights. And we're agreeing to a state on 22% of the land, even though we're half the population. And moreover, it's gonna be discontiguous while the Israelis have a contiguous state. Uh, and we're gonna allow the you know, major settlement blocks to stay. Uh, and we're gonna do land swaps with them. And the state's not really gonna be sovereign. And there is gonna be all these security restrictions and so on and so on and so on. And they still can't get that. And so from their perspective, um, you know, all of these things that are described in, in the mainstream US press as generous offers and they're unreasonable, you know, the, the reasonable thing would have been to grab at the 22% with both hands and say this is the best deal Israel could have ever hoped for. This is amazing and, uh, and we should leap at it and, um, and instead, it's treated as the maximalist position, and um, we need to, you know, wheedle down the other party uh, from there. Thank you so much. I'm learning so much being here tonight. I really appreciate you sharing with us. The Palestinians in your book, if you ask them what is your point of view on Hamas or Hezbollah, do you think that they um, represent you well? How would the average Palestinian in the enclave that you're describing to us, what do, what do they think of Hamas and Hezbollah? Um, so, you know, the central character Abed comes from a left uh, faction, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the DFLP, a Marxist-Leninist faction totally opposed to Islamist groups uh, like Hamas. And, um, and that's you know, the political party in which Abed was active uh, in his uh, youth. Um, but you know, the, the kind of quip that you would hear among Palestinians when you ask them if you know, one day there should ever be elections, uh, uh, as um, you know, unlikely as that may sound, you know, wh who do you think would win? They would say um, Hamas would win in the West Bank and Fatah would win in Gaza. <laughs> so they basically, the Palestinians would vote out. Explain why that's funny. Yeah, the they, Palestinians will vote out whoever's ruling over them. So the Fatah is controlling the West Bank. Hamas is controlling Gaza, and in each place, uh, the majority would vote against the essentially one-party state that they're living under. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I, we won't know until the you know an actual election happens. Um, so, so you will find um, uh, support for Hamas in Anatta. You'll find support for Hamas in many places in the West Bank. Um, but a lot of that is driven. Um, by um, total dissatisfaction with um, the Palestinian Authority and with Fatah and contempt for their political program, which has totally failed, and the fact that they're working hand in glove with Israel to help arrest and oppress their own people. Um, so, um, yeah. Hi, <clears throat> thank you for coming. I haven't read your book yet, but I'm looking forward to it. My question is about what did your Palestinian interviewees talk or say about Israel and what did your Israeli interviewees say about Palestinians? And it's hard to generalize, but if there are themes, because I'm wondering if in theory, you know, the restrictions on the civil liberties of Palestinians were ideally to be lifted, what do you think are the prospects for coexistence on you know, daily basis between humans? Um, you know, I think it, it as you say, it, it, it varies a lot from person to person um, uh, in this book. Uh, there are a lot of people who, in this book, a lot of Palestinians who uh, 
have wanted a, a two-state uh, outcome, um, partly because they didn't want to live with the, the other side. It wasn't out of some kind of search for justice or um, an end to oppression or anything of that kind. They just literally wanted the other side out of their face. Um, yeah, but you will also find people who, you know, Abid would say something more along the lines of what you're saying. He would say, you know, why can't we just all live together? Um, it's something I've heard him say many times. I, you know, frankly, I think that after October 7th, the idea of, um, you know, Israelis, the Israeli support for a one state solution with equal rights for all was less than a percent um, prior to October 7th, and now it's you know, less than a thousandth of a percent. Um, hi. Um, I'm wondering what the fact-checking process was like going back eight years ago, and in some instances, I'm guessing decades, um, so yeah. Um, painful. <laughs> um, you know that there there was a lot of uh, a lot of work. Um, and there were things that were very annoying, where where you know clearly somebody was misremembering something, and you could show them how they were misremembering it. Um, uh, it it was it was difficult, uh, but um, but that's that's the work. Thank you so much for, for the talk. It was great, very informative. Um, if you were to submit the manuscript after October 7, what would you have written differently or would you have edited it significantly, knowing what you know now? Thank you. Um, so as I said before, there, you know, I have this tendency to want to stuff everything in the world into anything I write, and I really didn't do that with this book. But there were a lot of there were Gaza angles that I could have pursued that I didn't that felt like tangents. Um, and characters who have close relatives in Gaza and families that are partially in Gaza. Um, so maybe I would have included a little bit of that. Do you expect to go back to Jerusalem to live? Um, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's an open question. It's, um, it's my life's work. I uh, want to go back, and I also feel um, really irresponsible bringing, I have daughters who are six, nine, and 12, and um, it's not even so much an issue of personal safety, which I think <clears throat> it will, uh, the situation's gonna get a lot worse, um, but it's more just the kind of environment they're gonna be raised in, and my inability to protect them from what they're going to be exposed to at school and after school and at friends' homes and um, uh, yeah, it's a it's it's a, an active um, debate that I'm having with my wife right now, and I think she actually feels more strongly than me. She'd like to go back, um, and I feel more ambivalent. Is it my turn? Okay, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about the use of a single story as a lens. So um, I appreciated that you said you were trying to find a way into showing the sort of everyday violence that so many Americans don't actually appreciate. Um, but yet you still chose this horrific one-time event to you know, expose that. And then I'm struck by, Peter, your question was October 7th, and that's a one-time horrific event that no doubt will be used to tell larger stories. But what we're witnessing in Gaza now is so mammothly, unbelievably, a combination of like, you know, no doubt hundreds of thousands of events. And so I guess my question is, do you have any idea of how it's not a predictive question really, but like how can a story of such catastrophe be told while you're living within it? 
you know, I'm not seeing very many singular like human interest stories coming out of Gaza and I assume there, someday there will be a book, but just something about like how can one story actually handle uh, the large catastrophe that we're witnessing? Um, I, I have seen a couple uh, of, you know, individual stories in Gaza. In fact, my closest friend in Gaza was the subject of um, an AP um, story. Um, and, you know, what he's experienced is nothing compared to other, um, other people in Gaza. Um, I guess, I, I'm sorry, can yeah. I just, I guess what I'm really concerned about is when this is all over, <laughs> and hopefully we see that in our lifetime, that the October 7th story will be the dominant story right. and everything else will be forgotten. I, I, I don't know if that will be the case. Um, I think there will be, of course, like ver a, a whole, uh, there will be, you know, some people who will want to just tell the story of October 7th and, you know, draw m many uh, right-wing conclusions from it, um, even without that story being, uh, you know, narrativized. It's already the case that October 7th has pushed uh, Israeli society very far to the right. Um, and um, I, yeah, I can't, I, I don't know what will be the global, uh, the global reaction, but I, I, I see that it's totally polarized now and I imagine that will continue. There will be people who are telling, I mean, it's also the case that people are telling the story of Gaza and ignoring October 7th. Um, I think that that's happening too. Um, so I'm not. Um, I don't know. Uh, w yeah, I don't know what will happen in the in the you know mainstream uh, press. But um, to me, it's it's um, it's something that's being fought right now, and it's it's not clear to me how it's gonna gonna play out. Um, yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, that was a really interesting talk. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I was particularly interested, I, I just hadn't really thought of it in these terms before, what you said about the original Zionists being anti-Semitic in terms of their uh, rhetoric about becoming not debt collectors and becoming physically strong and whatnot. Um, and I was curious, given that, which I hadn't understood before, how Israel, in your experience with like the rhetorical tradition resolves having that sense of national identity with being a country which, as far as I understand, largely serves the existing financial structures of the world, which are largely around debt collection and things which I imagine would fall into anti-Semitic stereotypes. Um, so, so, I mean, there is, a, there is a large academic literature on um, the idea of the new Jew is a central Zionist concept, and there's a lot of liter academic literature on um, uh, early Zionism and anti-Semitism. Um, but I, the second part of your question, you, I don't really understand what you mean, that Israel is serving the financial interests of debt co collection. I mean, why more so than any other capitalist, Western-oriented country? Well, okay. I mean, you, you could, yes, you could say that. I guess by virtue of its geopolitical position, it certainly does serve a role. There's a reason the U.S. provides so much money to it every year, um, aside from the, you know, you can people argue about that. Um, I guess I'm curious, I, I, as far as I understand it, they are not an agrarian, non-capitalist society. They are involved with banking the same as many people have been. So do, do they just think that that's compatible with their concept of the new Jewish person, or? So the, I mean, the idea of a new Jew is an old one when it's, you know, going back to the pioneering, the image of the pioneer who's, you know, working the fields and is strong and masculine and often there's a, a sub, 
subsidiary literature about just even the posters from that uh, era and how Aryan actually a lot of the, the people in that in the in those po early Zionist posters look. Um, but you know that's over. There's there's no, you know the the uh, kibbutz is like a, a relic. It's there have all become capitalist basically, and um, and so th that's like a, a, a historic trope. It's part of culture. You know many of the leaders of the judicial ref the protests against the judicial reform. Uh, consider themselves descendants of the idea of the kibbutz and the pioneer and all of that, but they themselves are, are very far removed from that. They're just living in a city like Tel Aviv. And they just don't care that it's not the new, uh, new Jewish person idea that the country was founded on. Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they're aware that, you know, there was a different era before, and now it's a capitalist, normal, you know, Western state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is there one more question before we wrap up, Professor Thrasher? Uh, hi, I'm Stephen. I'm a, a journalism professor here. I had a process question. Um, I was surprised that you said that you did not talk to your um, to your main interlocutor about what was going to be in the book. Um, and I don't show drafts to people, but I was trained in no surprises journalism, um, being edited by Mark Schuifs, who developed it at ProPublica, and editing that way at, at BuzzFeed, and I practice this myself um, and teach it to my students, that whenever we're interviewing people, like we go back to them and we make sure they're not surprised, we're not asking for permission, but we're hearing, you know, is there pushback? If there is pushback, you know, then we go back and report again and make sure that it stands up or not. Um, and Professor Dopplett, has developed a, a way of thinking about journalism that's kind of in line with IRBs that I found very useful for talking to my students about as well. When you think about how vulnerable are the people I'm talking to, you know, do I need to understand what their vulnerabilities are before I go forward for, with the publication? Um, so I was surprised that you said that you just that your um, main person was so so surprised when he was reading the book. So I mean, I I did you know there was a question earlier about fact checking. I I did go and check everything a zillion times with him. Uh, so he knew, uh, every, I mean, uh, by the nature of all of the questions that I'm folk drilling down, I mean, he would, when we gave interviews together, he would tell about how I, you know, tortured him with, you know, retelling in, in every little detail of some given incident in the, in, in the book. Um, so no, I mean, he knew I was very intent on getting these details. But that was what he said to me when he read that first part. You know, he he did know that I was, um, you know, taking notes and recording and writing down and asking him repeatedly and coming back and asking more about his early love lives. But then when you read it on the page, it's something different. I feel incredibly grateful that we were able to listen to you tonight. And I think what we've seen and listening to Nathan is um, what it means to have a life's work to which you're devoted and determined to kind of reach deeply into the history and talk to sources on all different sides. And I was, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about a piece that David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, wrote a couple of weeks ago after spending a week in uh, in Israel, and his opening line speaks of the complexity of this and of the humility that any writer needs to feel. And it, he, he wrote, the only way to tell this story is to try to tell it truthfully and to know that you will fail. And I feel in listening to Nathan that um, that might not always be true. I think you might have just nailed it. So thanks for being with us tonight, and thanks for the book. And there are copies outside for sale. <laughs> Let me add, too, there are copies outside for sale, and they are a rarity because the publisher is sold out. So grab one while you can, and Nathan will be around to chat. <laughs>